By now, most of you are familiar with the 11th hour charges against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Christine Blase Ford, a Palo Alto research psychologist, is claiming that when she was 15 and Kavanaugh was 17, he made unwanted advances toward her at a boozy house party. She claims that he tried to force himself upon her. Kavanaugh released a statement today emphatically denying the charges for a second time, saying this is a completely false allegation. I have never done anything like what the accuser describes to her or to anyone. But the 10 Democrats on the Judiciary Committee were unanimous in their calls to delay Kavanaugh's scheduled Thursday vote. And some weak-kneed Republicans, no shock there, like Flake and Corker, joined those calls. But there are holes in Ms. Ford's version of events. 2012 notes from her psychotherapist mentioned four men involved in the assault on Ford. Now, the accuser says it was only two men. Nowhere does Kavanaugh's name appear in those notes. And both Kavanaugh and the only other witness deny that the event ever occurred. Ford claims that she decided to come forward at this moment out of, quote, civic responsibility. But the timing, suffice it to say, is curious. Senator Dianne Feinstein had a letter from Ford detailing these allegations back in July. But she chose not to share it with the FBI or to raise it in 32 hours of public hearings. And of course, one hour of a private meeting with Kavanaugh. So why? Well, this all has the whiff of a political smear masquerading as a sexual assault allegation, one that 36 years later, let's face it, cannot either be proven or disproven. It's impossible to prove a negative. And questioning Ms. Ford and Brett Kavanaugh on this matter, it's unlikely to reveal anything new. But still, this afternoon, Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley announced that he's calling a hearing a week from today, giving both Kavanaugh and Ms. Ford an opportunity to be heard. But think about this for a moment. To furnish Democrats with another big top for their divisive circus may actually be a mistake for Republicans. Democrats have been salivating for another Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill-like spectacle to use as leverage against Republicans in the fall and maybe get some more uh, female voters uh, while they're at it. Here's minority leader Chuck Schumer. I think the <laughs> allegations of um, Professor Ford are extremely credible. Yeah. She took a lie detector right. test. She talked to this to her therapist. They were having family counseling in yeah. part because of what happened to her five years ago and told all the details. Mm -hmm. And third, to come out and say something like this puts you and your family through incredible scrutiny. Yes. People throw brickbats at you and everything else. She didn't do it on a whim. I don't think she did it for political reasons. Mm -hmm. So she has she a great deal it. of credibility. Every... No, uh, no one knows anything about this yet, apparently. She hasn't testified. But Chuck Schumer is supremely confident. But the very idea that Schumer or anyone else is going to be able to get to the bottom of a 36-year-old allegation is ludicrous. And Chuck, as you know, lie detectors aren't admissible in court for a reason. Lindsey Graham made a point, by the way, earlier today. He said it's a little odd that she even decided to take a lie detector test. She wanted to remain anonymous. Huh. Well, the fact is there is no way to ensure that Brett Kavanaugh will receive due process here. Because allegations such as this, they should have been examined in any of the six FBI background checks that Kavanaugh underwent. But instead, this was dropped less than a week before his committee vote. And as such, a lot of reasonable people can conclude that this is all part of a political hit job. A well-orchestrated Alinskyite maneuver timed to cause maximum damage to Kavanaugh, to President Trump, and the midterms for the Republicans. Put maximum political pressure on the Republicans, especially when you have people like Corker and Flake. They're not running for re-election. What, what are they supposed to do? Anita Hill this weekend dropped a statement designed to insulate the accuser from any criticism, frankly, any meaningful questioning. In box in any male Republican questioning Ford in, an, Ford in an open forum. She wrote the following. 
Given the seriousness of these allegations, the government needs to find a fair and neutral way for complaints to be investigated. I've seen firsthand what happens when such a process is weaponized against an accuser. And no one should have to endure that again. Christine Ford's attorney, Deborah Katz, echoed Anita Hill's thoughts and claims that her client is willing to appear before the Judiciary Committee. She is willing to cooperate. What she is not willing to do is to be part of this uh, bloodletting that happens in Washington. Um, we only need to look at the Anita Hill hearings to know what that's going to look like. And that's not a fair way to get at the truth. Think, think about this. Fair? It's a, it, what is a fair way? So anyone has the freedom, a male or female, has the freedom to drop damaging allegations just days before a confirmation vote when someone has been in public service for years and years and years undergoing six background checks. And then outside the normal procedures, they can drop a letter anonymously, have it leak out a few weeks later, and they don't get any criticism. You can't examine motives. You can't examine maybe holes in the, in the allegations. You can't examine any political affiliations. This is insanity. This does a disservice to the Senate. It does a disservice to the process. And it does a disservice to Brett Kavanaugh, given everything he has given to this country in public service. And Republicans who buckle to this type of smear and, and, and the type of, frankly, intimidation game, they don't deserve to be in the Senate for another minute. Any senator who would allow this to happen to a nominee of Kavanaugh's experience and integrity should look at his or her own. I've had the great privilege of knowing Kavanaugh for 25 years. I've known him socially and in professional circles. And I've known a lot of people in this town, both parties, but few. I can probably count them on two hands with his character his intellect, and his professionalism. I don't say this because he's someone I support for the court. I say this because I know him. And if this can happen to him, I tremble for this country and this process. And for any man or woman who find themselves up for a big job, who didn't spend his or her teenage years in a convent or a monastery. And that's the angle. Joining us now with a reaction are Suzanne Matten and Julie Duvall, both longtime friends of Jeb Judge Kavanaugh's. They also signed a letter of support vouching for Kavanaugh's character last week after the accusation against him first surfaced. We're also joined by Jen Mascott, a former law clerk for the judge, and also we share uh, having clerk for Justice Thomas. Great to see you. Uh, everyone, thanks for being here tonight. I know all of you are busy. You have lots of stuff to do. Uh, Suzanne, let's start with you. Uh, tell us how you knew, well, we all know him as Brett, but uh, tell us how you knew him. Um, I met Brett sophomore year in high school um, when I attended a private school, and we became fast friends from the beginning. Um, we remained friends throughout high school. We were occasional pen pals throughout college. Um, we have daughters that were born a day apart and oh. went on to be on the same lacrosse team. So we spent many of hours on the sidelines um, talking about old times and getting to know his wife, Ashley. And, and, and when you heard this allegation last week, um, you, all, you all ran around the same circles. Anything, when you look back on your knowing him in high school, anything to stick in your back of your mind, oh, this could have been Brett or immediately discounted? I immediately discounted it. He's, um, he's bright, he's honest kind and he's respectable and so the allegation is um, something that is completely opposite of the Brett that I knew then and the Brett that I know now. Yeah and Julie uh, you guys are old friends I know both of you from Washington Circle so I, I've known him not as long as you have but today in political maybe it was on MSNBC they started saying well the women who had signed the letter they only could get two of them to still say they were supporting Kavanaugh is that accurate? You know a lot of these young women, young, you're all young women, young women who signed this letter. You know them. Is that true? N not at all. Uh, it's, uh, 65 of us all are on the same page. Uh, every one of us is in agreement. We just, there's just been people calling everybody and making them nervous. And the, um, so they've chosen not to come on to TV shows 
or to use their name, but every one of us still stands by what we said in the letter. So that was just, that was complete disinformation. You know, people call it fake news. And why did you guys decide to come here tonight? You're both really busy, mothers, professionally. But you decided you weren't going to sit by on the sidelines. Why? No, I felt strongly that he was, he, he's got um, great morals, great character, and um, I've known him since 1980. Wow. This is not his personality. This is not anything that he would ever do. I mean, we used to talk on the phone every night during the weekday. He helped, he helped me with my homework. I mean, I, I used the right person to help me with my homework. <laughs> <laughs> you picked the right one. I always had friends. I always had my friends were always the smarter ones, too. Uh, I want to play, this was a moment on MSNBC today, Jen. Now, you worked uh, as a law clerk for him, both on the D.C. Circuit, where he's had an exemplary career, mm -hmm. and then you clerked for Justice Thomas, who, you know, this harkens back on my angle to what happened to him, which was so blatantly unfair. This is a moment on MSNBC today with uh, this woman, Simone Sanders, uh, CNN, excuse me. Let's watch. In a lot of these Me Too cases, Harvey Weinstein, who have fallen because of their disgusting past behavior, in, in almost all of them, it's a pattern. You see more than one. Absolutely. What if nobody else comes forward? Does that, does that change things for you at all? No, I, I, I still think Dr. Ford, uh, she has credibly come forward, in my opinion. I hope if there, is any, if there are any other women out there, they do come forward. Th these women are probably some of the most powerful people on the planet right now. John, I mean, so your reaction to that? I mean, apparently no pattern ever needs to be established. It could just be one person saying one thing 36 years ago. So, Laura, I clerked for Judge Kavanaugh his first year on the D.C. Circuit, so I've known him and his family for 12 years. And I have to tell you, utmost integrity, character, always um, has been a career-long mentor to me. Um, as you saw throughout the confirmation process, he's had women of all walks of life, from all sides of the ideological spectrum come forward, attest to his character, his integrity. He's mentored scores of women as students and law clerks. But they're actually saying that he did that. There was someone last week, forgive me for not remembering who it was, someone on one of the major shows was saying, oh, now we know why he touted the fact that he coached the a girls' basketball game and because he hired all these uh, women clerks because he thought that an allegation from high school was going to dog him. I kid you not, that's what they said. So Judge Kavanaugh has got an impeccable record, and, you know, he's hired women law clerks over the entire 12 years. But it was a pretext, according to some of these people. Well, not a lifetime pretext. I mean, as you know, we've seen people from all walks of life. He has an unimpeachable record. He's had a clear record. You know, people from back in his school days um, attest to his character. I've seen him in every case that he's considered during my time clerking for him and the years he's mentored me since then. I deeply admire him and respect him, and he'd be an excellent Supreme Court Justice. Uh how hard do you want him to fight to get this to get seat? This is going to be a fight. So he has categorically denied the allegations, and I think it's really important for people to, to listen to him and for him to stand strong in, in, in the truth that he knows and defend his character, yes. Uh, Suzanne, when I think about, um, I have two sons, age 8 and 10, okay, I think about even young women who are up for a big job or a big promotion, and None of us knows what happened. I mean, you guys went to a lot. How many parties do you guys go to? I mean, I went to a lot of parties in high school, a lot of parties, right? Of parties. I don't remember, you know, a, you know, yeah, I was at someone's house. But the idea that something that happens in high school 36 years later can derail a job when you have no pattern. Listen to what Jen just said. I've talked to, I don't know, 13, 14 just recently of his former clerks. And when you know, when someone's a creep, you know it. We all knew people who were creepy. I mean, we've all met people. Did he have, ever have any, a girlfriend or so, who said, ugh, not a good guy? Did, I mean, anyone like that? Because we know people who are creepy. And, and I've never heard anything like that about him, ever. No, and people talk about the speed at which we got the, the women together for this letter. It's because we were a tight-knit community. Um, we talk often. And um, when we wanted to rally for his character, um, we did. And if there had been even like the slightest, like you said, inkling of something to the contrary, we would Someone have would have heard it. Yeah. And Julie, any, any uh, thoughts from any of your friends or any people that you know who know the accuser, anything about motivation on this? Anything? I can't no. talk She kind of moved, she moved out of, out of town and, you know, she, people don't seem to know anything. It's just, it's an oddest, oddest thing.
but you guys want him to fight on, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and we're 100% and, behind him. Okay. Well, guys, thank you so much for your insights into his character and the person he is. And again, we thank you, and I know our viewers thank you for coming out. And, and don't let anyone intimidate you from having your truth, because I think that's what they want to do. Uh, ladies, thanks so much. And my next guest says how the Senate handles this particular charge is profoundly important to the dignity of the institution itself. We're happy to welcome back uh, to the show Judge Ken Starr, author of the new book, Contempt, a memoir of the Clinton investigation. Judge uh, you're on radio with me this morning and now right. tonight on the show. And uh, things have changed a lot from 930 this morning when you and I talked about this. The Senate has now scheduled another hearing for a week from today. This morning, you did not think that was a great idea to delay his confirmation hearing. Anything changed in the intervening uh, hours? No, I think the thing that is changing is there's this huge outpouring, and thank you for having uh, these friends of Brett Kavanaugh on who've known him for even longer, Laura, than you and I have known him. I've known him since 1994. I likewise can attest that in my interactions with him over the years, including as his supervisor, not once did I see any evidence of this kind of character Moreover, never was it reported, in fact, to the contrary. The outpouring that we're seeing now, and I know there's a lot of noise uh, sort of on the other side, but that's politically inspired noise. The people who know Brett Kavanaugh are saying to a person, he is a person of complete integrity and strong character. And you're so right in your comment that the character will come out Someone cannot year after year at Yale College, at the Yale Law School, in various clerkships, and then three decades of professional life here in Washington, D.C., be a neighbor, and yet be this kind of person who now is being described as a predator. This is just absolutely appalling. So no, it's I reprehensible. Wish this, I wish the Senate had stood firm. I understand due process but the process that the senate and this is what i said that the process broke down terribly when diane feinstein allowed then this process to remain what it is i don't need to rehearse the facts for this to be enshrouded in secrecy and then dropped like a neutron yeah. bomb. But judge, yeah, I'm, judge, but this was, the, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say you're too, you're very judicious. You're still your judge's day, so you're very you. judicious. Yeah, thank you're you. judicious. I'm going to say the way it is because I'm more cynical than you are because I've been here <laughs> too long, got to move somewhere else. This is all orchestrated. The idea that this is like some, oh, it just came out and I took a lie detector in August. Why did you take a lie detector in August? Why would you do that if you wanted to be anonymous? It makes yeah. no sense. But I got to play something for you. I'm dying to get yeah. your opinion on this. Okay. Tubin and Turley, two legal minds were out there today, differing views on whether you could ever even get to the bottom of, of this factual, uh, the, the factual situation 36 years ago. Let's watch. It's unlikely that we will be able to conclusively show that someone is, is lying and someone's telling the truth. It'll be left to a credibility judgment. There is other evidence out there in the world that we need to hear. Why was she in a bathing suit? Was, there, was this a house with a pool? I mean, these are all facts that can be determined. Uh, that narrows it down, a house with a pool and uh, Chevy Chase. Okay, Judge, there's not too many houses there. But what, what, what side do you come down on that? No, factual determination, impossible. So it's just the theater and the spectacle of it, which will build all week long. Is exactly. It's going to be drama. And I think this, again, is very unfortunate for the country, for our culture and our values. It's obviously very unfair to the Senate itself. This is a self-inflicted wound, as I see it, by the Senate just countenancing this 11th hour process that Dianne Feinstein is totally responsible for. I'm not going to attack the person who's making these accusations, but I am going to say the Senate should be acting much more judiciously than it is. And it is. It's going to be, I'm afraid, a free-for-all circus. Yeah. And that is unfortunate. It's unfair to Brett Kavanaugh's family. It's also unfair to the Supreme Court of the United right. States because when he's confirmed, then he nonetheless carries oh, this yeah. memory with him. This is about Roe versus Wade. I'm sorry, it's about Roe versus Wade. That's what it's all about in the end. Uh, Judge, thank you so much. And still ahead, why do some accusations matter? while others are ignored. Bill Clinton accuser Juanita Broderick is here and she has some questions for Senator Feinstein.
He's an outstanding intellect, an outstanding judge, respected by everybody. Never had even a little blemish on his record. Uh, the FBI has, I think, gone through a process six times with him over the years. At the same time, we want to go through a process. We want to make sure everything is perfect, everything is just right. Uh, I wish the Democrats could have done this a lot sooner because they had this information for many months and they shouldn't have waited till literally the last days. I don't know. It depends on the process. If it takes a little delay, it'll take a little delay. Has he offered to withdraw? Uh, next question. What a ridiculous question. Do you think his passport confirmation is on track? Oh, I think he's on track. Yeah. I mean, I think he's very much on track. And that was President Trump earlier today commenting on the Kavanaugh accusations, of course, and signaling that he is willing to give Democrats time but expects the nomination to proceed. Joining us now on the phone is Kim Strassel, columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and Chris Hahn is a radio host and former aide to Chuck Schumer. Um, Chris, I want to go to you first on this because there is something just wild uh, about an allegation that can be raised less than a week before a confirmation vote that has been in the possession of Dianne Feinstein uh, since July, I guess early July. If she held on to it. Uh, the accuser, for some reason, took a lie detector test. Lindsey Graham raised a question about that earlier today. It's curious. Uh, and then right before the vote, they dropped this thing. I was 15. He was 17. Um, do you have any reservations uh, as a man? I don't know if you have sons or not. And this happening, stuff that happens in high school right before a big promotion or a big job? You know, I, I have daughters. Uh, you know, look, I don't like unfounded reservations, but uh, unfounded accusations. But look, we're in a situation where a person is being elevated to the highest court in the land. He will never seek an election. He will never be confirmed by the voters and he will never have to stand before Congress again. The highest level of scrutiny needs to be applied in this situation, and Kavanaugh is receiving that scrutiny, and it is fraught with peril. The president's comments were as disciplined as I've ever heard the president be, because the White House knows that this confirmation is in jeopardy. And I think that Monday's hearing is a huge risk for both Kavanaugh and the White House and Senate Republicans. If they try to do what they did to Anita Hill, they will lose more seats than they could possibly think of in November. So, so there's a good think chance, someone, well, let me just Lauren, get I know this he's straight, a friend of yours, there's a good chance they will not even proceed ridiculous. to that okay. hearing on Monday. All right. Well, I clerk for Justice Thomas, full disclosure, I've known him for 35 years, okay? I've known yep. him for longer than I've known Kavanaugh. Um, so you're saying someone should be able to make an allegation where no pattern of such behavior is established, someone's been in public life for decades, and that person should be able to lob these allegations without questions about motivation, political ties, credibility, uh, or, uh, or other uh, contemporaneous comments to others well, when the act occurred. No, None of that can I, be pursued do, because that's a neat I position do, to be in. No, no. I do, think, I do think all of that should be pursued. I think the FBI should be investigating this claim. Okay. And they should find out what is truth and what is not truth. And maybe Monday is too quick to have a hearing for the FBI to do that. Yeah. I think everything okay. you just said should be looked into because I don't believe you should be able to just baselessly throw a political accusation well, out there. Well, yeah. but if there is when, truth it happens, to this allegation, when it happens to one of your family members, this man is going to sit members. on the Supreme Court probably for 30 years. It, 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 well, that gets to the rub of it. And Kim, I know you're on the phone, but uh, I want you to listen to something. This was Angela Rye, a Democratic commentator today on CNN, which I think speaks to some of the perhaps political implications of all of this and what might be really going on here. Let's listen. We need to remember what will be before Brett Kavanaugh if he were uh, nominated to the Supreme Court. Um, women's choice, um, equal pay, workers' rights. And if he has a pattern and practice of demonstrating that he cannot ever side with women or that women are beneath him, I think that this is another piece of this. But Kim, there's a pattern in practice of Judge Kavanaugh doing the exact opposite, elevating women. More than half of his law clerks uh, have been women. Of course, his, uh, his, his work at the White House, his work as a uh, young lawyer. Uh, I've known him socially and professionally for more than uh, two decades, almost three. And just an exemplary person and among women. Uh, your reaction to that? Yeah, correct. And this is the problem with the argument that, oh, you should go out there and find the truth. 
uh, as you've been saying on the show, there is no way to verify this, uh, in part because the accuser herself can't recollect key details. And I think what's really important here is we can have this hearing. Uh, you could even have the FBI look into it. I think that's a terrible idea. But it's still going to be he said, she said in the end. And what defines part of this is that what she is doing is very different from other allegations that have happened as part of this Me Too thing. And people need to bear that in mind. You know, for starters, she can't provide details of even the year of when it happened, which denies Judge Kavanaugh the ability to perhaps prove he was somewhere else. She told nobody about it contemporaneously. And so there is no one to actually, in fact, verify this. Um, and, and there's just a lot of that that makes all of this a very, very difficult accusation to just hold on its face and say, well, uh, we obviously have to pay more attention to it than a lifetime of service and everything else that he has demonstrated. That's one wow. other thing. People we know, by the way, no, people that have been accused of this and have admitted to some of this, Harvey Weinstein, they have a pattern of such behavior. You don't do something like this one time in your life, and yeah. there is nothing to suggest that this I, judge uh, well, has done this. Here's, and, and, I, and I agree, you look for patterns and things like this, and so far we haven't seen anything like that from Judge Kavanaugh, but this is not a court of law. This is a court of public opinion. It's really a court of opinion of about two or three senators on the right who may defect in this nomination and have been looking for a reason to defect, and this might just be that reason. So there needs to be a full vetting of what happened, and there's going to be, and since they decide to have a hearing, they well, should really investigate what happened and maybe even yeah. delay this hearing until they figure that out. Well, and, and that's, I mean, the Democrats want to delay it and delay it delay it because the more they think they can drag it out, the more political uh, traction they think they get with this because it becomes a battering ram in the midterm elections. I mean, let, the idea that this is all, everybody's acting benevolently and all the Democrats, oh, they just want to get to the truth. If they wanted to get to the truth, the most senior member of that committee for the Democrats, Dianne Feinstein, a senior woman at the committee, would have pursued this aggressively and Brett Kavanaugh could have testified in those three days of raucous hearings about that and his views on substantive due process. But they didn't do that. Why did she not do that? Does that bother you, Chris? Because it bothers the hell out of me. You know, it does trouble me that this wasn't pursued immediately. I'll admit to that. But I think perhaps that's why she took the lie detector test. Perhaps she was not believed fully by Senator Feinstein and her staff when this first came forward, and they needed that proof from the lie detector to move it forward. Well, and that just happened in August, which was not too long ago. Yeah, so here well, we are. We're at this point. There's going to be there's going to be a hearing. And frankly, it's dangerous for Republicans to even have this hearing. OK, which so it's damned if they do. They do. So what do you think? You should pull the nomination? nomination? I mean, you're basically saying you have to do it to pull the nomination. It's, it's ridiculous. I, I mean, look, a, a, a if, I was, if I if I was advising, if All I was right. If I was advising the president, I would try to get to the truth of this from, from the, the nominee. If I wasn't fully satisfied, I would pull the nomination. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I well, disagree. That's, that's this convenient. is not dangerous for Republicans. I wish they were not holding this hearing because, by Hugely the way, dangerous. this allegation is, is too old, too unsubstantiated, and too procedurally flawed. Okay, guys, too, high school. Too. I guess everybody in high school, there's no, no, in high school, we all have to go back. In high school, what'd you do? I'm sorry, but it's 17 years old, and you're not you're not you're not accused of a crime. There was no contemporaneous reporting of this. Apparently, I mean, maybe maybe someone else will come out of the woodwork. I don't know, but God, my goodness, I, I find this to be just insane. And I don't know why ever, anyone, frankly, lives in Washington after this. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Straight ahead, Juanita Broderick, who of course accused Bill Clinton of raping her, is calling out Democrats' hypocrisy over the Brett Kavanaugh allegations. She joins us to sound off next. Christine Blase Ford has made a serious allegation against Brett Kavanaugh, and as we said earlier, the accusation should be investigated. Democrats, though, are happy to oblige if they don't drown in their own hypocrisy first. Fox News Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry joins us to explain. Ed. Laura, great to see you. Dr. Ford, as well as Judge Kavanaugh, have been invited to testify in public next Monday by the Senate Judiciary Committee. The White House saying Kavanaugh will testify tomorrow if they want because he's so eager to clear his name. Remember, Democrat Dianne Feinstein, as you just mentioned, has known about an anonymous allegation along these lines since July, had not said anything until late last week, something President Trump noted today in comments at the White House, telling reporters that the senator should have had the courage to confront Kavanaugh face to face. Well, Philip Wegman writing today in the Washington Examiner that Feinstein, as well as 
Leading Democrats Chuck Schumer, Dick Durbin, and Patty Murray were all in Congress when charges of rape were leveled against then-President Bill Clinton. Wegman writing, quote, Juanita Broderick accused then-President Bill Clinton of raping her. Clinton was not a teenager at the time, in his hotel room during his first gubernatorial race in Arkansas in 1978. The Senate was in the middle of an impeachment trial in 1999. Not one of those Democrats called for an investigation into the Broderick accusation. So when Durbin tweeted this over the weekend, quote, if the Me Too movement has taught us anything Thing, it's that we must respect and listen to the survivors of sexual assault, regardless of the age of those involved or when the alleged attack took place. Broderick was not buying it, responding on Twitter, quote, well, Dick, do I have a story for you? Once upon a time, Bill Clinton raped me. You voted not guilty on both counts at Clinton's impeachment. You didn't give a damn back then. You, Dickie Durbin, are a complete fraud. Well, here's what Broderick has said previously about a confrontation she had with Hillary Clinton. Listen. She came over to me, took a hold of my hand, and said, I've heard so much about you, and I've been dying to meet you, or been wanting to meet you. I can't, it's just paraphrasing right now. And she said, I just want you to know how much that Bill and I appreciate what you do for him. And she held on to my hand, and she said, do you understand everything that you do? I mean, cold chills went up my spine. That's the first time I became afraid of that woman. Now, Democrats have been noting the shoe may be on the other foot now for Kavanaugh. Remember, during the Clinton administration, he was working on independent counsel Ken Starr's team and was pushing for as much transparency as, transparency as possible about Bill Clinton's personal life. Though it's important to note that rather than running from this accusation now, Kavanaugh has gone on the record to deny it and has said he's willing to testify as soon as possible, Or, All right, thanks so much, Ed. And as Ed highlighted, Democrats sang a different tune when multiple allegations of misconduct were raised about Bill Clinton. Joining us with more is Juanita Broderick, who famously accused the former president of raping her. Uh, Juanita, I know when you watch this unfold today with the sanctimonious comments from everyone from Chuck Schumer, uh, of course, to Dick Durbin, Dianne Feinstein, what ran through your mind? Oh, it makes me go back to 1999 when uh, Dianne Feinstein, along with every other Democrat, refused to read my deposition to the independent counsel. They wouldn't have nothing to do with it. Uh, that just shows you the difference in the double standard that existed back then and still does today. I think, it's, uh, I think this is astonishing that they can do this to Mr. Kavanaugh. Well, if, if your allegations should have been taken more seriously, why shouldn't this woman's allegations be taken seriously as well? I mean, the process notwithstanding, should, should her word not be respected? Just because it wasn't, yours wasn't respected years ago, why not respect her word and at least give her a chance to be heard? Oh, I think that she should be heard, but I still have so many reservations about her comments. I can't imagine a young girl going through what Miss Ford said she went through and not tell anyone. You know, what I went through was horrific. And of course, the lady that found me was the first one that I told. But I told four other people. That's just something that I can't imagine that you can keep to yourself and not share with one of your closest friends. Well, there are a lot of people who have been victims of sexual abuse or, or uh, serious harassment say every story is different. There were a number of women who called into my radio show today, Juanita, who had actually been victims of rape and other sexual assault. This is a montage of what some of them said. When I was 19, I was sexually abused. I know I've never forgotten the situation, and I cannot believe that this woman suddenly remembered now. I was raped 40 years ago, and I'm absolutely furious, and I know that this is a last-minute ploy again by the left. Having background myself of being a rape victim, you do not go about this the way this is coming out. This is for attention, and that does... A a horrible service to people that have actually had everything taken from them. I used to be a Democratic. I will never vote Democratic again. Uh, Juanita, quick response. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, you, I still just can't imagine it. I, you know, people say, why didn't you go to the police, Juanita? Why didn't you do something? Bill Clinton was the police. 
I had no one to go to. It's like when Eric Snyderman's victims came forward and said, you know, when he was the Attorney General of New York, what do you do when your sexual abuser is at the highest law enforcement officer in your state? What do you do? Well, uh, something that happens in high school is very, very difficult to get to the bottom of 36 years later. Uh, and obviously she's not right. accusing Brett Kavanaugh of raping her, but is, is, she said, apparently she said she was concerned that that might happen if someone wasn't in the room. But again, he said, she said, it's very difficult, no pattern of such behavior. Juanita Broderick, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And President Trump. Let's talk about this with Britt Hume, Fox News senior political analyst, and Chris Darwalt, Fox News politics editor and the editor of Halftime Report. Britt, if I could start with you, because I wondered if you had a little deja vu all over again when you saw this uh, news break over the weekend. And then you have Senator Collins of Maine tweet that came out just a short time ago. Professor Ford and Judge Kavanaugh should both testify under oath before the Judiciary Committee. And in addition to that, she says she is going to speak outside of her office on camera at 4 p.m. this afternoon. What might she say? I have no idea what she's going to say. I assume she will affirm that that this episode occurred. Um, and, and the parallels, I must say, when you mentioned deja vu to the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill situation are really quite striking. Uh, it was very late in the process uh, when Anita Hill came forward with this allegation of, uh, of improper sexual conversations from Clarence Thomas to her. Uh, and that resulted in you know, last-minute hearings at which she testified to the point, Dana, where we even had a hearing at one time on a Sunday in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I remember being at a football game. I was assigned to the White House, so I didn't have to cover the hearings, but I never missed a word. And I was at the game watching the Washington Redskins play. I can't remember against whom. And I had the game in front of me and the hearing and a, on the radio and a headset in my ear. Intense times they were, and in the end, of course, it was kind of a standoff. Anita Hill couldn't prove her allegations. Clarence Thomas, although he, he certainly denied them, never mm -hmm. could disprove them, mm -hmm. and it ended up in kind of a, a kind of a, of a of a standoff, and and he got confirmed. Britt, um, to John Roberts' point that he just mentioned that the White House is allowing the Judiciary Committee to decide how to move forward with what type of a hearing they might have. Can you remind us, like in 1991, was there closed testimony and then public testimony after that? I don't, I don't remember whether there was any closed. There might have been staff interviews, mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember any I, All I remember was the, was the, was the, the hearing yeah. in the, yeah, and they were in the old caucus room, which I guess the Judiciary Committee isn't using anymore, where you know, many famous hearings had occurred. And in the end, of course, it was Thomas who basically said, look, this is a lynching, a high-tech lynching of an uppity black man. And that seemed to scare the daylights out of some of the Democrats on the committee. The Democrats held the, held the Senate in those days 56 to 44. Uh, and Thomas ended up being confirmed 52 to 48. Mm. Um, I, and Harlan Specter, Republican senator yes. from Pennsylvania, whom we all remember, who had been a prosecutor and was a noted cross-examiner, cross-examined Anita Hill and called her a perjurer, right. publicly called her a perjurer. Right. I don't think there's a snowball's chance mm -hmm. uh, that any such accusation will be hurled at this witness in this current Me Too atmosphere. So, Chris, if I could turn to you then for the politics of the moment. You had Senator Jeff Flake early on over the weekend say, I'm uncomfortable moving forward with a yes vote until we hear from Ford. It sounds like Senator Grassley is trying to do just that. He put out a statement saying that he has tried to uh, figure out a time to do some uh, phone call interviews, but that Senator Feinstein is not responding. Well, look, this, nothing, we're on pause. Nothing's going to happen here until the testimony, and it's got to happen. Every, the consensus is forming. Uh, I know from talking to some people in a position to know uh, that Republicans want to get this. They want to get on with this. Uh, Democrats, interestingly, kind of want to get on with this, too. Uh, while a lot, a, a lot of them are pushing for a delay, there's a political consideration here. If this seat remains open, if uh, there is either an extended delay or the Kavanaugh nomination is ultimately taken down, mm -hmm. if this seat is open, that puts red state Democrats in a very difficult spot of having to argue to well, voters that they should be allowed to stay. I did want to ask you about that stay. and then get your take and then Brits uh, as we wrap up here, because Last weekend on Friday, we would have thought that it would be likely that you could probably get four or five uh, Democrats to go ahead and vote for Kavanaugh because there's no real reason not to. Do you think that that has changed regardless of what happens in this testimony? 
I think for Claire McCaskill, uh, things got a little harder uh, in terms of vote, being able to vote for Kavanaugh, uh, certainly with her base and with her supporters. Uh, but there's another political consideration here, too, which is Republicans can't look like ogres and they can't look like they are, uh, uh, are brushing aside these considerations when it comes to persuading suburban women voters who are going to be watching how they handle this very, very closely. Britt, what should we be paying attention to in the next 48 hours or so? Well, first of all, I think, Dana, the, the likelihood is this is going to take a while. Democrats will do everything they can to prolong the process. They'll want the FBI possibly to conduct some kind of a full investigation. That, remember, that's where Feinstein referred the matter, and the FBI simply passed it on to the White House. Um, but they'll want a, they'll want a, a, a pre uh, to have, have some um, preparation for a hearing. They will they, they won't agree to a hearing anytime soon. The witness may not. Um, because they're hoping to stall this to the point where we're getting into October, mm -hmm. uh, and and if they can somehow stall this past the election, uh, and they get control of the Senate, uh, Kavanaugh would never be confirmed in a in a, in a Democratic held Senate. So keep your eye on the set of Republican senators who might be persuadable one way or another: Jeff Flake, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, uh, uh, that group. Um, they're the ones to watch in the days in the, in the days, and I think it'll be weeks ahead. All right, very interesting. Britt Hume and Chris Starwalt, thank you both. The top Democrat in the House, Nancy Pelosi, is responding tonight, saying, "Quote: The president is potentially risking the lives of our patriots by compromising sources and methods. Also, he can advance falsehoods and false narratives that distract from the truth of the Trump Russia scandal." So reaction now from the other side. Let's bring in Republican Congressman from New York, Peter King, who sits on the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, Congressman, great to have you with us. I'll start by asking you to respond to your colleague, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she's entirely wrong. There's going to be no uh, uh, sources or methods being disclosed here. What will be disclosed is the American people will find out that there was no basis for these uh, FISA warrants, that the uh, important information was kept from the court. Uh, there's going to be a disproportionate uh, uh, influence of the dossier. Also, you're going to find out that uh, people like Carter Page based an investigation of him when no one would seriously think that he was any kind of an agent of the Russians. Basically, you have a counterterrorism tool, a tool that's used to protect us from terrorists is instead being used, that's the FISA court, is being used to spy on an American campaign, a presidential campaign, unprecedented in our history. I want to recap for folks so they know exactly what the White House, what the president has asked for tonight, declassified or released these things. Portions of the Carter Page FISA application, uh, FBI reports of the interviews that they had with Bruce Orr, FBI reports of interviews in connection with the Page FISA applications, and also the, the president says they want all these unredacted text release regarding the Russian investigation. He named several people, Comey, McCabe, Page, Strzok, Orr. Um, what do you think we will learn from these things? I think you're going to find out that there was, if there was any collusion, it was uh, involving the FBI and uh, Fusion GPS. The fact is that there was uh, an attempt to bring down President Trump before he was elected during his campaign and also afterwards. Now, whether or not this was concerted, whether it was intentional collusion, or there was just a meeting of the minds of people, uh, of people who wanted to stop Donald Trump. But the reality is you're going to see that there's such a commingling here. You have Bruce Orr, you have his wife who's... Uh, Bruce Orr is in the Justice Department. His wife is with Fusion GPS, involved with Christopher Steele. I mean, all of this going on. There's such a, uh, a, a, a contradiction here, and it goes against the whole spirit of the FISA court. I mean, FISA, FISA court is almost uh, sacred in that you've, the government has an obligation to disclose as much as they can to the FISA court. There's no one else in the court who opposes this. So they have an obligation, when they're laying out their case, asking for this unprecedented power, this really unique power to be, uh, in effect, spying on, on, on Americans, that they have to lay everything out for the court. They did not do that here. I can't go into all the details, but when these FISA applications are made public, as I've seen them, you will, the, all, the, all the American people are going to see is that important facts were not disclosed to the court, including the basis of the dossier, uh, how unsubstantiated it was, how unreliable Christopher Steele turned out to be, all of this we brought out, and how anyone who can base an investigation around Carter Page, 
to say that he was some kind of a Russian agent is, again, a total distortion of the uh, FISA court. And, and Congressman, I want to quickly ask you about a story we reported on Friday about Evelyn Rodriguez. Um, she has been honored at the State of the Union by President Trump. Uh, her daughter allegedly killed by MS-13 gang members, and apparently she was hit and killed by an SUV on Friday just ahead of a vigil for her daughter. We know the investigation's ongoing. The driver stayed on the scene. So far, we haven't heard of any charges filed, but I know uh, that she was a very prominent voice. No, she really is. In fact, I was with her, her husband today. I was at their home in Brentwood. This is a terrible tragedy. She is one of the most unique, exceptional women I have ever met. Uh, her daughter was brutally murdered with machetes and baseball bats, and she was killed. And uh, uh, she never, Evelyn never let this get her down. She just became a strong advocate against MS-13. She led the fight. She worked closely with President Trump. She worked with Democrats, Republicans. I was proud to call her a friend. I was proud to represent her in Congress. Uh, she's just a great woman. She had lost such a horrific death. It was two years to the day yeah. after her daughter was murdered. She was killed at this exact spot where the monument memorial was to her daughter. Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely incredible. Uh, uh, again, it's beyond grief. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what their family is going through uh, tonight and in these coming weeks, months, and years. Uh, Congressman King, thanks for stopping in. Good to see you. Let's get more on the Kavanaugh situation from George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley. John, thanks for being here. Thank you. Quite some developments here. Where do you think this is headed? I think it's heading to a public hearing. I, there is a move to try to have some type of closed hearing, but I think we really are past that. Uh, the, I think the Republicans are accepting they're going to have to have her testify, and if she testifies, the expectation is that he will have to testify. And that's not going to be a good situation for him because he can't finish with a tie here. You know, if he comes out and both of them are believable to some and not others, uh, you still have a situation where he could bleed off two or three votes, and that's the margin that he has. Speaking of that, one of those votes is Senator Susan Collins from Maine, uh, one of the Republicans who has uh, obviously some concerns about the nomination, but also about this. Here's what she said just a short time ago. In order for me to assess the credibility of these allegations, that I want to have both individuals come before the Senate Judiciary Committee and testify under oath. So essentially, we are looking at a Clarence Thomas situation and Anita Hill. We are. Uh, but here is the first uh, nominee I know of that's been accused of effectively attempted rape. You know, with Thomas, it was sexual misconduct. Uh, here, you have someone who's saying that th this, is so, this is a nominee who tried to rape me. He vigorously denies that, says he wasn't even at that party. He's having calls with uh, staff members on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Clearly, he's pushing back here. Uh, if Democrats believe this accuser for him as a nominee, does that mean that they are going to start impeachment proceedings if his nomination is polled? Because why would he be eligible for the second highest court in the land? Right. That's the problem, is that you can't stop this train halfway through the, uh, down the track. If you believe he was, he is an attempted, that he was a, 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 someone who tried to do an attempted rape uh, or, or uh, sexually assaulted an individual, it's hard to imagine he could be an Article III judge. So the Democrats may find themselves buying more than they're bargaining for. They would, you know, it would seem rather incongruous to have him remain on the D.C. Circuit if they're denying it on this basis a uh, seat on the Supreme Court. And how much does the 36 years factor in that it was high school? He, again, pushes back hard that this never happened, but just the time frame. Well, there, there, is a, there is a real fairness concern here, not just because this was delayed since July. It was when they waited until just before the vote for confirmation. But they're also throwing this controversy into the mix, involving witnesses that, if they have any recollection at all, it's over three decades old. That takes time. It takes time to try to put together people, recollections, and any type of evidence that you have. He doesn't have time right now if they're going to push this vote. But if they don't push the vote, then they push this process potentially past the midterm elections. Which becomes another political issue. You wrote an op-ed for The Hill in which you wrote, among other things, quote, it is a good thing there is not a Doppler radar for hypocrisy or Washington would be in the midst of a mandatory evacuation. What do you mean there? Well, it's, it's, it's a curious thing to see. Some of, I testified during the impeachment uh, hearings for uh, that related to Bill Clinton. Back then, uh, 
um, there wasn't this movement, you have to believe her. It wasn't just her, it was them. It was multiple women came forward to Paula see Jones, that, and Juanita Broderick, claiming uh, not just sexual assault, but rape. They brought forth evidence that they claim supported them on a contemporary basis. Many of these same members were, did not say that they had to believe them. To the contrary, they were attacked. And the Republicans back then, of course, wanted full disclosure. And so you're going to have Including the Including Brett Kavanaugh and Judge Starr's. That's right. And, and Kavanaugh wanted not just disclosure, but rather vivid disclosures as to what Bill Clinton did. So everyone's effectively going to switch sides in this, which is going to be rather daunting for people to watch. But watch they'll have to do, because it's unlikely that we will be able to conclusively show that someone is, is lying and someone's telling the truth. It'll be left to a credibility judgment, and you're going to have to make that by what you see in that hearing. So we are at the beginning, not the end of this process. I'm afraid we're at the, the rather messy beginning, and it's going to be an even messier ending. Jonathan, as always, thanks. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning of your monologue, which was excellent, when you said that this is a matter of justice. And in America, you know, we have news breaking every minute on this story, so I'll, I'll keep it big picture. But when in America did justice mean taking one person's allegation at face value and using that to tear down a man? It is not just to tear down Judge Brett Kavanaugh based on one sole accuser. And the fact that the left now has all of a sudden changed the rules to say that this is credible because one person said it, I think is abominable. I think that it says a lot about the left that they would use uh, Christine Blasey Ford, they would use her as a prop which is exactly what they're doing. They are using her as a prop for a political objective. And it's just, I mean, the, 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 the fact that they're saying we are strong, we, we stand with women, we stand with the accused, meanwhile, using her for political purposes, I really find disgusting. I, I do as well. I mean, I cannot get past the fact that Senator Feinstein knew about this for two months. She chose not to say anything. This is literally what the hearings in the Senate are for. If you do not do your due diligence and bring these things up in the hearings, then you lose your uh, privilege of asking of asking Kavanaugh about these things. This is a political attack against Kavanaugh, against the Trump administration. If there's proof of wrongdoing, I'm happy to listen to that. There has been no proof other than this allegation, John. Yeah, and I mean, when, when is Dianne Feinstein going to have her Spartacus moment? You know, C Cory Booker saying, I have to release these documents, I don't want to. Of course, that ended up being a huge farce. But when something actually matters, like serious allegations about sexual assault, why are the Democrats all of a sudden, oh, no, we can't release this because of our integrity? And if there is evidence, I agree. I'm, I'm happy to listen to it. But I just don't see how we get any, any more evidence out of this. Because the two people who were in the room uh, with Christine... Category, category, categorically deny it. They say that it didn't, have, Brett obviously does not, denies it, Mark Judge denies it. So what else other evidence is there gonna come from except for the therapist whose story uh, doesn't match? So, you know, I, I doubt we're gonna see any evidence come out of this. I also uh, think that she deserves to be heard. So I think in these hearings, if she has more evidence to present, let's see it. If, you know, people wanna come out and say she did tell me, but I don't think we're gonna see any of that. So at this point, we're kind of at a standstill because all the evidence we have has been presented and it all actually works against Christine. Right, and this is, I, I, I agree with Senator Lindsey Graham. I know that's not something that I say too often. I agree with <laughs> Senator Lindsey Graham here when he says, listen, we shouldn't degrade her, we shouldn't demean the accuser, we should listen to her, but she needs to respect the process in the Senate here. We are scheduled to vote on this as a committee uh, on Thursday, and she should testify before that happens, because otherwise that's disrupting our, uh, our process. I don't think that Republicans should flinch here, John, and I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't take serious uh, allegations of sexual misconduct. It's because the Democrats have proved to us that they are willing to use uh, anybody, really, whether it's women, whether it's minorities, whatever. They're willing to use people as political pawns.